format, uh, which is to start off with uh, the epidemiological update, uh, followed by our main talk for the afternoon. And uh, as Wendy said, we have had some problems with the UCT network. Touch would uh, all, uh, be reliable for us for the next uh, hour or so. Um, so uh, to give us an update on the epidemic at the Western Cape, uh, I'm going to hand over to Andrew Bull. You, you know Andrew well by now, Western, from the Western Cape Department of Health, as well as from the UCT School of Public Health. Uh, and Andrew will give us a brief update of the, the data on the epidemic in, in our province. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Graham. Uh, and greetings, everyone. Um, so the, I'm going to be very brief today. Um, firstly, just uh, we always show a slide similar to this, just to show the evolution in testing and case ascertainment. So the top left graph is the number of tests being done in the province, and you can see a consistent uh, uh, number of about four thousand, four to five thousand, sometimes higher in, on weekdays. Green being NHLS, blue being private. The olive green was the community testing, which is which is much less now, um, and the proportion that are positive reached about uh, just below forty percent, and it's it stayed there thereabouts. Um, even come down slightly since then. And because the number, the amount of testing is stable according to the new testing uh, guidelines of, of symptom driven uh, or, or uh, clinical needs driven testing. So the number of cases uh, emulates the, the, the number of tests uh, quite, quite closely. So the theme that I'll be showing is, is consistency of, of numbers. So, but before I get to that, just two items to flag from a case management perspective, and it might be interesting to have a presentation on the national track and trace system and a future uh, webinar. Um, the Western Cape is uh, piloting with national uh, digitally supported track and trace system in which um, Patients will be automatically contacted by uh, uh, SMS and invited to join a WhatsApp channel. And they will be invited to get their results and uh, into a, um, a self-management uh, dialogue uh, with the system and also invited to uh, alert the system of any contacts if they are positive. And many of you may have encountered patients who have already been um, uh, contacted by the system. And then from a case management perspective, if that system works well, the department is looking at um, focusing rather on the people who are not self-managing and especially those people at high risk. And there's a whole strategy, especially for uh, active case management of uh, diabetic patients stratified by um, severity of disease. And uh, there's a call center that's operating centrally that is um, uh, assisting with, uh, at the moment, mostly the private patients uh, in order to reduce the burden on the provincial uh, substructure staff. Looking at uh, clinical events, um, we also show graphs similar to these. So top left is daily deaths. The blue is the ones that we know about in the department. We anticipate delays in reporting. So the orange is adjustments and the yellow is um, uh, deaths that we uh, project based on uh, comparisons to the population register where we know we missed deaths um, and uh, also deaths in patients, the gray being deaths in patients where we don't, uh, haven't made a diagnosis, but we assume that, that we estimate um, uh, exist. And you can, although there, there's a graph here which shows a, a increase, this is our risk scenario, but in, in, if you look at the trajectory, it's actually pretty flat and, and already deviating from the, the risk scenario. The risk scenario being the, the provisioning that the department has catered for were cases to increase consistent with the epidemic up until that date, uh, assuming continued uh, increase. Um, the same pattern on hospitalizations, uh, ICU general and green being general um, and, and gray being PUIs fairly flat over the last while. Um, and that pattern, uh, if you look at the growth and deaths in blue, so uh, this is a cumulative deaths on the log scale, and look at the growth and deaths in blue in the Western Cape, it's definitely uh, slowed down. And if you look at the other provinces, um, which you'll probably all know from the media as well, the Gauteng in green is now on a doubling time, not dissimilar to what the Western Cape was uh, uh, some, some time ago. 
uh, light blue is other provinces besides KZN and Eastern Cape, KZN gray and Eastern Cape in, uh, in the kind of mustardy yellow. Um, and uh, just to also show the, the, the consistency of, of pattern as these are dead, this is the blue, the same blue that's up here plotted against other countries um, and showing that we, before making any adjustments, we have had a very stable, almost a month, the measured number of co confirmed COVID deaths per day has been, uh, uh, when smoothed, has been fairly fairly consistent um, uh, at about uh, six, six, per, uh, uh, six per million per day. Um, what I haven't uh, managed to bring through today, but it's coming out probably today on the MRC website is the triangulation, but is the other data from the population register, which pretty much show the same pattern. Um, that the difference between what was expected and what is happening at the moment has, has pretty much stabilized, especially in the metro. Um, moving on to... Um, uh, looking at it geographically. Uh, so the... There's quite big differences if you look at the column that I'm highlighting now and uh, deaths per million between the most affected sub-districts and, uh, and the rest of the province. And, and no, notably, if you make an adjustment for um, uh, age and sex structure of the, of the sub-districts, you'll see that Kailicha is um, by, um, by, quite, by margin um, has the highest uh, uh, age sex standardized mortality at the, at the moment. Um, and uh, Mark, at the moment, I can't click forward. I don't know if I've lost. There we go. Um, and the in, the interest is if we've got sub districts that have been so severely affected at this stage, so already having uh, in Slipfontein 800, Kylie, 650 deaths per million. Assuming that that we're at the crest of a of a wave and that these will double, that takes us into into territory that is 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 very high. Um, how is that consistent? If we're seeing a plateauing on in, in clinical events across the platform, is it being driven by the more heavily affected districts? Is there some kind of saturation? So when we look at that uh, geographically. I'm just trying to advance the slide. There we go. So here, the those two sub-districts that we just looked at, uh, Kailich and Klipfontein, are on the yellow, and these are deaths per day. You can see there has been a, a reduction, uh, but it's, in fact, the rest of the metro, which is in blue, has also had a reduction. So uh, if it is a saturation, it's happening similarly across sub-districts, which might, might be different in that the socioeconomic uh, status of the of Clifontein and Kailich is probably more homogenous and there's probably more heterogeneity in socioeconomic status and uh, density and other factors within the other um, uh, metro sub-districts. But the phenomenon seems to be spread across the metro and our rural um, uh, districts are, are probably running a little bit behind us and you can see that they are still having consistent increases. Um, and, and again, this, and just to mention that this is deaths by, da uh, by, by uh, date of death reporting, which is um, uh, compensates for delays in, in reporting because we're assuming that the lags are the same in every day's report. So although we know that there's lags, we're expecting those lags to be consistent and for it to average out. And then just finally, we haven't really uh, focused on, on healthcare workers. Um, it was just quite interesting to, to, to look at the trend in the number of health workers being infected. Now, this is not all healthcare workers. It is largely driven, 85% of this is automatic ascertainment of healthcare workers through linkage of um, employment data to, uh, to COVID uh, laboratory data. So it probably um, underrepresents many categories of health workers and uh, underrepresents the private sector but it does provide a reliable trend line and um, for, for what it's worth, um, this, may, this may be of interest. Um, it's also showing a fairly, uh, fairly stable pattern over, over, over a period of more than a month. Um, and that, that's, I think that's all I have for today, with the usual acknowledgements. Great, thanks very much, Andrew. So just uh, one question from my side, 
Um, I think you, you, you kind of broke it down by categories of, of districts, but are there any um, districts within the Western Cape where there is still an exponential growth or are we seeing the same pattern of a plateauing in, in all the different uh, districts that you're looking at? So, so, so far we're not seeing, uh, um, I wondered about Eastern, because, uh, but the numbers are too small to say definitively whether there's exponential or, or, or faster growth there. It seems to be fairly homogenous across, across the metro. The numbers get quite small when you break it up uh, too small and across the, the non-metro uh, districts, the numbers are still quite small. So it's very difficult to, to say. And I mean, just to, just to be clear, I mean, we're not, we're not talking about a decrease in numbers of deaths it's, it's a plateauing is that correct uh yeah you can uh, you can you can you can look at it uh with the uh, <laughs> depending on the eye you look at it with but I, I think at the moment we don't have evidence of a consistent decrease where it's more an evidence of a plateauing mm -hmm. and and, and as, i suppose the interesting thing is that w this is happening in the context of the rest of the country having massive increases and so in terms of non-pharmacological uh, non, um, interventions, we wouldn't expect the Western Cape to be vastly different to the rest of the country. And we're also seeing parts of the Western Cape still having fast growth. So it's a, it's a phenomenon that's happening in the context of uh, an assumption that uh, transmission would ordinarily have expected to be increasing, not decreasing, based mm. on interventions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew, for that update. Uh, uh, again, very much appreciated uh, bringing us up to speed with the epidemic in the Western Cape. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, our main speaker for this afternoon, um, who is Greg Caligara. Greg's going to address the issue of high-flow nasal oxygen therapy uh, in COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, and uh, Greg, just by way of introduction, is a respiratory and critical care physician uh, in the Division of Pulmonology at Hrutiskia and, and UCT, and a researcher uh, in the Center for Lung Infection and Immunity at the University of Cape Town uh, Lung Institute. Uh, he's also the medical uh, director of the Thoracic Transplant Program at Hrutiskia um, and helped to establish the ECMO services at the hospital. Uh, now, over the past four months or so, Greg and his colleagues uh, have been have led uh, the expansion of the high-flow nasal oxygen services at Krodeskia. Um, and I mean, from my perspective, I found it quite astonishing the results in, in many patients treated with this uh, modality. Uh, we've seen patients coming into hospital with profound hypoxia and respiratory distress, uh, who previously would have been immediately intubated um, on arrival at the hospital. Uh, who've been stabilized on high-flow nasal oxygen devices, and some of them have been supported throughout their hospitalization and subsequently weaned with, without requiring mechanical ventilation, and therefore, thereby avoiding the need for intubation, ventilation, and all its attendant uh, complications. Uh, Greg obviously gave us a talk uh, around two months ago on uh, COVID pneumonia in general, and I've asked him to give another talk this afternoon, uh, specifically focused on the practical aspects of high-flow nasal oxygen delivery. Um, and uh, to, to touch on issues like which patients are appropriate for this therapy, uh, establishing and maintaining uh, patients on high-flow nasal oxygen, uh, and then troubleshooting problems that occur. Uh, and also to discuss our experiences at Hrutiskia in general. Um, and so, I'm going to hand over to Greg, who will give, give the talk, and that'll be followed by a panel discussion, and I'll introduce the panel uh, when we get to that point in, in the session. So I'll be to you, Greg, and, and thanks very much for uh, giving a second talk uh, on, our, on our webinar this afternoon. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for asking me to speak again. Um, I would just want to say that I'm going to be talking about certain makes of high-flow nasal cannulae, but I'm not receiving any funding um, from any of them. Um, so this is the outline of my talk. Um, I'd like to just briefly revisit the rationale for non-invasive support in COVID-19, um, look at some of the mechanisms for improved oxygenation and, and why we think high-flow nasal cannulae might be um, a good way to administer oxygen in this condition. Um, it comes with some specific logistical and infection prevention and control considerations, which I will just briefly touch on. Um, but as you say, I, I really want this to be a practical approach to the use of this uh, type of respiratory support. 
So I'm going to talk about what the indications are and where high-flow nasal cannulae fit in, in the oxygen ladder. Um, we're going to spend some time looking at the individual components and also how to set it up. And then lastly, we're going to troubleshoot shoot some common problems. Um, I'm going to leave the discussion uh, section to talk about controversial issues like uh, transferring patients between centres when they are on high-flow oxygen um, and where uh, this technology, whether it should be centralised or decentralised. And then lastly, I'm just going to talk about what our outcomes are, and I'd like to just say that I'm going to present some combined data between the teams at Kudiskia and at All right, well, I think a couple of things have led to us thinking differently about uh, respiratory support in COVID-19. Um, we know that a sizable proportion of patients with COVID-19 will require ICU admission and possibly mechanical ventilation. And we also know that the outcomes of ventilated patients, um, although variable, um, haven't been great. Um, we know that ICU mortality uh, is higher than in other uh, forms of ARDS. And so people have been interested in looking at other strategies that improve oxygenation that don't require mechanical ventilation and all its attendant harms. So this brings me to the technology of high flow nasal cannulae, which really I think we must demystify. Um, it's not a very fancy technology. Really what it is is a machine that blends oxygen and room air along with a humidifier. So uh, it's able to uh, heat and saturate uh, gas at very high volumes, um, which comes with a, a lot of increased comfort for the patient, whereas uh, large volumes of dry air um, are often harmful and can cause necrotizing uh, tracheobronchitis. How does it work? Well, firstly and most importantly, it's a very comfortable interface, and this is in contradistinction to other forms of non-invasive ventilation. You don't need a tight seal. Importantly, for patients in the ward, you're able to eat and drink. And for infection control, patients can wear a simple surgical face mask. I've spoken about the heating and humidification. Um, but the main mechanisms of action are that it provides large quantities of gas which wash out the dead space in the nasopharynx and major conducting airways. And this allows you to deliver a reliable amount, a reliable fraction of inspired oxygen, and also a certain amount of positive end expiratory pressure, which is able to increase the functional residual capacity of the lung, which we know as the oxygen reservoir, and also decrease the work of breathing. So although there's not a lot of good data to back this up, high-flow nasal cannula oxygen has been widely endorsed by the WHO and uh, a lot of other respiratory societies. But its utility has largely been extrapolated from other studies of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, which almost invariably have a high uh, proportion of patients with bacterial pneumonia. Nevertheless, it's been incorporated into the Society for Critical Care and Surviving Sepsis Guideline um, algorithm for the treatment of COVID-19 with hypoxia. And you can see here that they say in patients that are not tolerating the usual or conventional forms of supplemental oxygen administration, that high flow nasal cannula oxygen can be considered. Briefly, there have been some concerns um, that high flow nasal cannula results in increased aerosolization of viral particles, um, which comes with an attendant uh, infectious risk. But um, there have been a lot of mechanistic studies published recently showing that this is largely overstated. And actually, the aerosolization risk from high flow nasal cannula is considerably less than other conventional forms of oxygen administration. There are some very um, important considerations about oxygen supply that need to be entertained, especially when scaling up this technology at a hospital. Um, and this includes both the total oxygen supply um, as well as the reticulation, in other words, the caliber of the pipes at each bed head. And this is something that needs to be explored with the engineers at your local hospital. Briefly, um, this is a, 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 a very elegant um, fluid dynamics modeling uh, picture showing how your nasopharynx and conducting airways get washed out with um, high volumes of gas with a very high FiO2. And really, um, the problem with any form of oxygen administration at the mouth is that it competes with rebreathing. And we know as your minute ventilation goes up, as you become distressed or if you've got respiratory pathology, um, the amount of rebreathing increases. And so you can see from this bar graph on the right that high flow nasal, nasal cannula achieves uh, an 80 to 100% washout at 60 liters per minute. Um, and that goes down as your respiratory rate increases. What about PEEP? 
Well, although this is present, um, its effect is, is actually quite small. And you can see that the amount of PEEP delivered goes up as your flow rate goes up. Um, and it's highest at the end of expiration and also unsurprisingly with your mouth closed. All right, so moving from the more theoretical aspects, I'd like to talk about the nuts and bolts of uh, high flow nasal cannula administration, the setup of the machine, the indications, what consumables are involved, how you set the flow rate as well as the FiO2, how you escalate oxygen therapy and then obviously wean if patients are improving and how to troubleshoot some common issues. So for the purposes of this talk, and because these are the machines used at Critiscare, I'm going to talk about these two devices, um, and I'm going to actually uh, refer to them interchangeably. Um, the one on the right is the AVO, um, which has been in the market for uh, more than 10 years. And then the other machine that we're using, which has been bought on tender for the state sector, is the Inspired O2 Flow. But they're pretty similar in terms of how they work and um, how their consumables look. So when do we consider high flow nasal cannulae? Well, we are using it for anyone with confirmed COVID-19 pneumonia, but as the number of cases have been increasing, we've also been offering it to patients who've got a very high suspicion for COVID-19 pneumonia with little in the way of a differential diagnosis. Um, we use it when patients are saturating poorly, and in this setting defined as a SATs less than 92%, despite oxygen via at least a reservoir bag at 15 liters per minute. Importantly, we think high flow nasal cannula requires an awake cooperative patient with the ability to awake or self prone, which is another important intervention which has been shown to improve oxygenation to patients with COVID 19. Contraindications, other than obvious um, ENT problems that uh, preclude the use of a, a nasal interface, are hemodynamic instability and any altered mental status, which is a a poor prognostic sign and usually means that patients are hypercarbic um, or very hypoxic and really should be considered for intubation. This is our uh, protocol. So as I said, if people are, uh, if a patient is not saturating well on at least 50 meters a minute, um, we consider awake self-proning and we undertake a senior clinical review to consider the use of high flow nasal cannula. Um, patients who are tundered, confused, have rising oxygen requirements, um, are declining or are hypercarbic um, should be reviewed um, uh, in anticipation of intubation and should probably not be considered as candidates for high flow. Um, what's quite novel in the way that um, this form of respiratory support is being offered at Critiscia is that conventionally these would be patients with respiratory failure being managed in a very high care setting of the hospital. So presumably at least a respiratory high care unit or an ICU. But purely because of resource constraints and increasing demand, um, we've been looking at whether this therapy can be offered in the general medical wards. And although we have uh, dedicated high flow uh, bays within the COVID wards, these are really high care areas in name only and not really nursing ratios. So we're not um, staffing these areas um, as, as ICUs or as high cares. Um, we are monitoring with simple monitors like just a pulse oximetry. Um, we are trying to minimize the amount of blood draws that are done also just to uh, decrease the, the burden on staff. And really we are trying to just look at parameters like pH and pCO2 on a venous blood gas rather than the requirement to do regular um, arterial blood gases. And then lastly, um, there aren't very good guidelines on when patients are failing high flow, and we still rely on a pretty composite clinical assessment of whether the patient is tiring and whether they need to be intubated. How do you start high flow nasal cannula practically? Well, um, I think we should start it at least 50 liters per minute to get that benefit of the, of the PEEP that I showed you in the previous graph. And then we titrate the FiO2 upwards to maintain saturations of at least 92%. If you start at a lower flow, um, and really the only reason to do this would be to conserve um, the hospital's oxygen supply, um, you can then increase the flow at increments of 10 liters per minute, um, and you can use the patient's respiratory effort as a good guide to know whether this needs to be increased. As I said, one of the major benefits of uh, having a nasal interface alone, which is light and quite comfortable, is that patients are able to feed themselves and take in orally, 
Um, and also when you're cohorting a lot of patients in a single area, you can also use a face mask, um, which will hopefully reduce droplet spread in the area. These are the components of the high flow circuit. And um, we have a humidification chamber, which has got a, a metal bottom, and um, which slides along into the machine um, and is heated to allow um, water in the chamber to evaporate. There's heated tubing, which may or may not have an inbuilt uh, heating coil as well as an oxygen analyzer. Uh, there's a patient interface, which is a set of uh, pliable uh, rubber nasal cannulae that fits uh, snug in the nares. And then lastly, there's an air inlet filter. Um, and just to point out that this is a, a filter for air that's coming into the machine and so it isn't really contaminated with any viral particles from the patient themselves. How do you set the machine up? Well, firstly, there's an oxygen um, uh, hose or gas line which connects directly into the wall and you turn the machine on. And this is um, one of the uh, reps of the devices, Julia Glassford, who's, who's helped us a lot and who's consented to be in these photos. And this is Julia sliding in the water reservoir into the machine. It's got a slot um, and a ridge along the um, uh, water chamber, so they, 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 they fit snugly. You then connect what looks like um, the usual interface that you would put into an, a, a, a vacuum liter of IV fluid. You connect that into a bag of sterile water and uh, that feeds automatically into the water chamber via the inlet pipe. And the humidifier's got a little float inside it, so you never have to regulate the amount of water. It'll just fill automatically. Then you plug in the heated tubing into the machine. Next, um, if the machine has this, and um, some of them um, have it inbuilt in the tubing itself, you may need to connect the integrated heater cable and uh, oxygen sensor. Um, then you choose the appropriately sized nasal interface for your patient. Um, some of the machines come with little cards that you can measure the distance in the nostrils to see um, what size cannula to use. Um, you connect the interface to the tubing and then you're ready to go. So you can connect the interface to the patient and then start to set your um, required flows and FIO2s on the machine. So how does that work? Well, firstly, the high flow nasal cannula machine comes with its own uh, oxygen flow meter, which is uh, graded up to 50 or 60 liters per minute, which is much more than the one that normally goes into the wall to which you connect nasal cannulae or, or a venturi face mask. And really, what you have to think of this is as uh, the oxygen being delivered by the wall is the numerator in the equation that determines the FiO2 or fractional um, proportion of oxygen that's delivered to the patient. So the, the oxygen flow rate is the numerator and the total bulk flow, which is set by the machine, is the, new, is the denominator. So if you are flowing at 60 liters um, on the machine and you're flowing at 30 liters at the flow meter, then you're delivering an FiO2 of 50%. And, and some of the machines have got um, these nice tables that, that tell you how to increase it. But basically, um, what you're looking at, and this is, this is the Evo interface, there are only really two things to set on the machine. The one is the temperature. Okay, so that's the temperature of the humidified gas that's given to the patient. Uh, 37 degrees is the uh, default temperature, but sometimes patients complain that that's too warm, and so you can change that. And the second thing that you can set is the total flow. So that's the denominator in, the, in my previous slide. And the FiO2 is something that's actually measured by the oxygen analyzer. So you can see whether you're delivering the FiO2 that you want to. And I must say, um, when I first using, started using this machine, this was one of the things that confused me and, um, uh, and others, I think, as well, because you automatically want to try and dial in the FiO2. I can just uh, go through some uh, common problems that we've encountered. I think firstly is um, it's very important to choose the cannula size that's most appropriate for the patient. Um, uh, patients that need the small cannula um, are limited by the actual diameter of the tube, so you're usually only able to flow at about 50 meters for patients that uh, require that size. But common problems include kinking and malposition of the, of the cannulae. And, um, and this leads to two problems. Firstly, obviously, um, problems in oxygenation with the patient. But the machine's flow sensor is quite sensitive. And if one of the cannulae going in one of the nostrils kinks, 
then the flow drops quite dramatically as the machine picks up increased resistance. Again, just to stress that the FI2 is not set, but it's measured by the analyzer, and that's determined by the oxygen flow rate, which is set at the oximeter or the flow meter on the machine. And that's different from the total flow rate, um, which is what's set at the machine and is, uh, implies the amount of room air that's mixed to get a certain FI2. And then lastly, very importantly, as I've mentioned, chat to the engineers at your local hospital about the oxygen reticulation, um, particularly if you're finding that you're not reaching the desired FiO2 or not able to reach certain oxygen flow rates. That might be a global supply problem, but it also might be a local problem in the ward that you're trying to offer this um, therapy. And that's particularly seen if you're running machines in series. Remember that if you're offering an FiO2 of between 90 and 100% oxygen and you've got two or three machines in a row, you might be using upwards of 180 liters of oxygen a minute. And it depends on um, what the diameter of the, of the pipes are in that bed head, whether that is able to be delivered. Cleaning, well, it's quite easy because all of the disposables can be discarded. So there's, um, there, there's not much that you need to do. Um, you can take alcohol solution and just wipe down all the surfaces, including um, the, the, the heating chamber where there may be water droplets. Um, that external uh, air filter that I showed you about uh, can be replaced between patients, although that's not absolutely critical if there's a high turnover, and um, probably once every day or two is fine. Um, you clean all the cable and hoses using an alcohol solution, and then clean the stand and the flow meter. So in general, there's no sterilizing of the machine that's required. Um, and just the one make that I mentioned, the Airbo, does have an internal cleaning step because it's got a small piece of um, pipe which is actually running within the machine, but that's done automatically by the connection of this uh, piece of red pipe, um, and it takes about an hour. So the turnover between patients should be pretty sh pretty quick. Right, in the, in the time that's remaining, I'm going to just quickly present some of our outcome data. And before I start, I'd just like to recognize that this is a collaboration between ourselves um, and Tigerberg Hospital, the team there uh, being uh, led by Kuni Kuklenberg and Usha Lala, who's uh, joined us for this call. Um, and I'd just like to uh, acknowledge uh, Gordon Audley and Pindila Gina, um, and uh, particularly Gordon, who's done a lot of the legwork in uh, collecting some of this data. So, so we've got 294 patients between the two hospitals who've been treated with high flow nasal cannula oxygen um, since the start of the COVID pandemic. Um, and I'd just like to take you through some of the uh, broad descriptive characteristics. Um, as you can see, um, the age is, is relatively young, um, and this is in contradistinction to the use of high flow in um, the European populations where it was largely reserved for elderly people who weren't ICU candidates. So because of the pressure on ICU, we're trying to use this in the pre-ICU environment. Um, as we've seen elsewhere, um, there's a male predominance of patients with severe respiratory failure. And unsurprisingly, more than half of the patients are um, either obese or morbidly obese. 54% are diabetic. Um, only 15% were HIV positive. And as with other descriptive studies looking at time to onset of ARDS, we can see that we also had a median of about seven days of symptoms before the onset of respiratory failure. Uh, I've been accused of overemphasizing this, uh, this, this piece of information, but I'm still struck at the uh, median PF ratio of patients who are considered for a non-invasive form of ventilation. So uh, the, the ratio of PaO2 to FiO2, which is something which uh, is used conventionally to grade the severity of ARDS, and less than 100 being severe, you can see that our cohort's median PF ratio was 68, with an interquartile range of 54 to 92. Um, these patients straddle um, the announcement by the recovery trial on the utility of dexamethasone, so you can see that steroid usage wasn't universal in this cohort. And then very importantly, I just want to differentiate our two hospital settings in that at Tigerberg Hospital, patients who've received high flow have been admitted to the ICU, whereas, as I said, at Critter um, uh, where the majority of the patients have come from, we've managed these patients in a respiratory or COVID high care in a general medical ward. So this is our uh, preliminary data. So as I said, we've got 294 patients that we've treated, of which 26 are still receiving treatment. So there are 268 patients who've completed uh, an outcome on high flow nasal cannula. 
Um, we've had to intubate 105, okay, of which 67 died, 28 are still ventilated and 10 were discharged from ICU, but 121 were successfully weaned, so that's a 45% survival. Um, I think it, it's very important to note that the, a sizable number of patients died during half nasal cannula therapy. Uh, 17 of them were patients who had been reviewed by ICU and declined based on comorbidities or, or other risk factors, but 25 uh, died unexpectedly. So um, it's important to note that um, what we're trying to do, which is to offer people respiratory support where resources are limited, comes at the risk of possibly uh, delaying um, intubation uh, in patients that are very ill. And unfortunately, I think we do get it um, sometimes wrong and patients die very suddenly if their nasal cannula uh, dislodge and they become hypoxic. So just to put this in context, and, and this is very preliminary data, um, and this is Christelle Arnold Day, who's one of the uh, intensivist fellows at Credit Skier, and she's been analyzing this data, and I, I don't want to quote any specific figures, but I can tell you that our preliminary look at patients who get ventilated for um, ARDS at Credit Skier, so bearing in mind that at our setting, at least only ventilated patients are admitted to ICU, and we're looking at between a 20 to 25% survival. So if we add in the patients that were successfully treated with high flow and those that survive ICU, we're looking at an overall survival of patients with severe ARDS and COVID-19 pneumonia of about 49%. Just to drill into a few of these uh, results in a little bit more detail, um, if we look at patients who were successfully weaned, we've had one patient who died unexpectedly in the medical ward, 16 who are still admitted, but as you can see, the overwhelming majority of these patients um, were discharged well. Um, an important consideration if you're thinking of offering this at your hospital is that the mean time um, to either intubation or weaning is quite different. So in our setting, it was about a median of two days before patients uh, failed high flow nasal cannula if they were going to. But in our successes, um, we needed to treat patients for at least seven days. So um, this is not something that you're going to be able to use and turn patients over on a daily or, or um, in a very short time. Again, um, there's a differential success rate depending on where you offer this therapy, and I think we could have another discussion about um, you know, the confounders for this data, but certainly the um, uh, need for intubation in patients treated in the high care ward was much higher than in those that were treated in the ICU, bearing in mind these were at two different hospitals. Lastly, I just want to show this graph which shows the time to intubation in patients who ultimately fail high flow nasal oxygen. And about 15% fail before six hours and about a quarter fail before 12 hours. So there's a sizable proportion of patients who fail early. Now, there's, I think, an important uh, reason for this in that um, we're offering high flow at critical scale virtually as patients arrive in C15. In fact, we've even had patients that have been started on high flow um, in the casualty uh, itself. And um, although this might not always be strictly correct and some of these patients probably need to be intubated and, and it shouldn't really have been trialed on high flow. High flow is a um, non-threatening uh, form of respiratory support to people who may be intimidated by the risk and the danger of intubating these very sick patients. And it often buys you time while you're able to mobilize intubation teams, which we're very lucky to have at our institution, and also to confirm with ICU whether a bed is available or whether the patient might be a candidate. So although this um, does look like there's a, there's a high early failure rate, I think that pragmatically in practice, it does allow you to uh, manage very hypoxic patients in the short term um, while you're planning an exit strategy. So if I can summarize my take home points in the time remaining, I think that high flow nasal cannula is certainly not a substitute for mechanical ventilation, but it may be a useful type of respiratory support in COVID-19 pneumonia. I think in limited uh, resource settings like our own, um, using high flow nasal cannula in severe disease and even outside the ICU has the potential to save at least one in three lives. And obviously that comes at a much lower cost than ICU care. Um, survivors require the therapy for at least a week. I think one of the big unknowns is that the threshold for intubation needs clarification. So on, one hand, on the one hand, we've got um, patients that are very sick, that we're kind of pushing the boundaries of what is an acceptable 
um, level of support to offer someone without intubating them and we're balancing that against the perceived poorer outcome if they require mechanical ventilation. But obviously that comes with a risk and we saw that with, with the number of patients who die on high flow unexpectedly. But clearly um, this is a, a compromise that we've been forced to make and, and will be forced to make, particularly in settings with limited access to ventilation. But lastly, I think the data shows us that the aerosolization risk is largely overstated. And I can't stress again how scaling up would require an ongoing monitoring of, of not only the local capacity for oxygen delivery at your hospital, but also that of the oxygen supply chain. And lastly, I look forward to analyzing this data with my Tiger Wood colleagues in more detail uh, in order to provide some data on what predictors of high flow failure might be. Just want to acknowledge the large team at Critiscia who's been involved in this. And uh, I think it's important to note that this has been a service that's largely been driven by the doctors and nurses on the floor of the general medical wards and um, with the input of um, the clinical technologists at our hospital who really uh, provided an invaluable service. And I think I've already acknowledged uh, Kuni and Usha from Tigerberg um, for sharing their data and Julia Glassford from Phoenix Neomed um, who supplied the uh, Inspired machine and um, for her support of our service and as well for allowing her to, for, for me to take photos of her setting up the machine for this presentation. Thanks for your attention. I look forward to the discussion um, in the question time. Right. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, that was an excellent overview and I'm sure will be very useful to colleagues uh, around the country who are listening in uh, who want to scale up this uh, at their respective hospitals. Um, so, so really a great overview, very practical. Uh, telling us, you know, the nuts and bolts, as you said, of, of doing this and some of the uh, sort of really uh, gratifying outcomes that we've seen in patients at, at our two hospitals in Cape Town. Um, so we're going to move over to the panel discussion. Um, and our panel uh, is made up of Usha Lala. Uh, Usha is the head of the COVID ICU at Tigerberg Hospital. Um, and uh, Lydia Cancross from the Department of Surgery at UCT in Khrudeskia. Uh, Lydia has been working uh, in the COVID service uh, in our wards for the last two months or so. Um, and Linda Boloko, who is a specialist uh, physician in the Department of Medicine at UCT and Kritzke, has also been working for the last three or four months uh, in the COVID service. Um, and all of them have practical hands-on experience of uh, managing patients on high flow as well as troubleshooting some of the problems. So I know there, there was some difficulty finding Usha um, on the uh, on, on the webinar, Mark, have you managed to find her to unmute her? Well, we had such a response today. We're still having some issues finding her, but uh, 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 Professor Ken Cross and Dr. Beloko are online. I'm going to then uh, sort of bring in Lydia and, and ask Lydia if she wants to make any comments or, or uh, pose any questions to Greg. Um, thanks very much, Graham, and thanks, Greg, for, for that excellent presentation. I think um, it's, it's really been eye-opening for a, a non-physician coming into the service and seeing the impact of, of high flow um, and seeing the positive outcomes for a number of patients. And I think it's, it's something important to note that it's, it's not a technically difficult um, technology to work with and that uh, you can quite quickly skill up a team. Um, and we have interns who are seeing patients in the ward and, and presenting on ward rounds and doing that you know, quite successfully. Um, you've asked me to kind of look at a few of the practical things and some of the considerations and perhaps Greg could comment on some of these. So, you know, some of the, the, the barriers that we come up against would be the patient that plateaus on high flow. So kind of day eight, day 10, they're not deteriorating, but they're still on FIO2 of 95% um, and just not improving. Um, what would your comments be and suggestions around that? Um, and then the patient that deteriorates suddenly on, on high flow. Uh, I think one of the most difficult things is the decision of when to intubate those patients and when to refer them to ICU, particularly those who have been on high flow for a long time, because we know the ICU outcomes for those patients are very poor. Whether we have delayed the intubation too long or whether it's disease progression is very difficult to say. Um, and I know that Greg's got quite a nice checklist of what to go through in, for those patients that are, are failing late, um, things that we should try not to miss. Um, and then I suppose the last practical aspect is the middle of the night, walking through the wards, um, patient is desaturating. What do you look for? Check the nasal cannulas are actually in the nose. Neither of them is pink. So if the patient isn't lying on the tubing, 
sometimes someone has turned down the FIL2 on the dial for some reason. Um, so it's sort of practical things that are important um, for, for you just to check when you go through. So those are some of my insights and a few questions really for, for Greg to answer. Thanks. <coughs> Sorry, Lydia, I heard this, the second question, which was about intubation. Can you just quickly tell me what the first question was again? You're on mute. Um, you're on mute, Lydia. Oh, sorry, the, the patient that plateaus, sort of day 8 to 10, just not improving and stuck. Um, what should we be thinking about then? Okay, so um, I think I'll deal with the first, the second question first. So, I mean, as you know, Lydia, we've agonized together over these patients in the middle of the night um, in, in C12. And the decision to intubate is really a, um, quite an agonizing one. And I really do want to acknowledge that the, the, the way we push patients on high flow nasal cannulae in the COVID era is something that never would have happened four months ago. These are all patients that would require mechanical ventilation. There is a perception that um, you know, these patients if ventilated will be worse. And we certainly have seen in, in, in our wards, patients who decline intubation, um, who are advised that they are sick enough to require being intubated, and, and they decline intubation not once, not twice, but sometimes three times, and, some of, and, and they have survived. So clearly the, the limits are, are very um, difficult um, to ascertain. I must say, I, I would caution against us adopting a standpoint where we think that mechanical ventilation is um, futile. And certainly, I think and in the Kurdiskia cohort, we've seen more and more survivors as um, the, uh, the epidemic or the pandemic progresses. Um, the first question of, of what to do with a patient who plateaus on, on, on um, uh, high flow, well, um, the checklist that, I, that you alluded to, I mean, I always try and think about um, is this a patient who is suboptimally anticoagulated? And we heard last week from Sean and from Jessica about um, why uh, there might be heparin resistance and why we should possibly be looking at factor 10A levels to optimize anticoagulation. Um, is there nosocomial sepsis? Um, that's quite difficult to um, assess in patients on high flow. The x-ray isn't really helpful. If you put somebody on steroids, the white cell count might be up. Um, there are other reasons for a PCT to be elevated in patients with ARBS, so it, it can be quite tricky. Um, and then the last thing is just to make sure that patients um, don't have a cardiogenic cause for worsening um, respiratory failure. So, so looking specifically for myocarditis and heart failure, particularly as this is a group of patients that are, are predisposed to cardiovascular disease and are forced to endure um, uh, quite severe hypoxia. But um, yeah, certainly don't have any of the answers. Um, we also considered um, steroids on patients who kind of pl plateau um, after a prolonged period on high flow. Um, uh, I think Graham spoke about this as well. Um, we, we, we consider organizing pneumonia um, as so that's persistent inflammation um, or persistent kind of fibroblast activation within the alveoli, which persists beyond the infective phase of the illness. So we may consider re intensifying the steroids at that point, but there's, there's clearly no data to guide us on that. Uh, Graham, we believe we have found uh, Dr. Lala. We think she may be cloning you, hence our difficulty in finding, <laughs> finding her. I can, Usha, are you there? Uh, we, I can uh, keep trying. Um, but uh, then to move on to um, Linda Baloko, who, as I said, is a specialist physician working in our service. Um, and Linda, you know, you've had a lot of experience now over the last three months or so. Um, any sort of points that you want to bring in about troubleshooting and any questions you want to pose to Greg? Um, just to thank, thank you very much, Greg, for a wonderful presentation on this very useful uh, mode of uh, uh, oxygenation. I just want to follow up on the question that was put on, to, on Greg uh, by Lydia. With regards to um, clinical indicators for failing this form of therapy and obviously the clinical decisions that we have to make with regards to uh, intubation, I just want Greg to comment on the utility of scores such as the rate of oxygenation to decide which patients may actually fail very early on to make a decision about intubations. Because uh, we've seen in our wards that these patients, it's often very difficult and we push these patients very hard 
despite their confusion or whatever other indications that would ordinarily intubate this patient, uh, other patients outside of COVID for. So I just want practical standardized, standardized um, utility of these clinical scoring systems to decide which patients might be intubated very early on. If Greg could just comment on that. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Linda's referring to something called the ROC score, R-O-X score, which is a validated um, a clinical score for, for predicting patients who fail high flow in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in non-COVID pneumonia. Um, and it's supposed to be a simple score because it includes the SATs divided by the FiO2 divided by the respiratory rate. So you can see it's a composite measure of oxygenation and respiratory effort. Um, what's tricky is that, and I mean, I, I did mention we are looking at this at the moment, so I can't give you the, the final answer, but we found that there is a clear, well, I mean, there's a statistically significant difference between patients who fail high flow um, and those that don't in terms of their ROC score on day one. So that would be within the first 12 to 24 hours of going on high flow. And bearing in mind that there's 25% who will fail early. Um, but what we haven't really shown yet, and I'm, I'm still looking at it, is whether there's an, a significantly different discriminant value um, of this to, to be able to dichotomize um, the patients into two groups. So obviously there's a, there's a large degree of overlap and we've looked at the rock curve for that. And uh, basically it's got a sensitivity of about 80%, but a specificity of 50%. And uh, I'm not sure that's quite good enough. So it may be that we'll need a more composite clinical score um, with another variable. And the one that um, I, I think may be useful is heart rate. And, uh, I mean, I'm saying this to you, but I know that, again, me and you have stood at the bedside of many patients and said, oh, well, you know, their SATs are 90% and their respiratory rate is 35, but their heart rate's only 80. I think they, they're still okay. And, and certainly in my experience, like patients who develop a tachycardia are often uh, people that are, are on a slippery slope. So it may be that we might need to come up with a different um, clinical score that will predict intubation in COVID and pneumonia. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be able to show some of that soon. Yeah, so Greg, if I can just push you on that, the, the um, I mean, just to follow on the, the question of Linda's, Linda's kind of, uh, you know, asking from a kind of analytical perspective, a scoring system, but I, I just want to get inside your head at uh, 12 o'clock at night, you're standing at the end of a bed of a patient on high flow. You know, some practical advice for clinicians about what are the factors, you spoke about a composite clinical assessment. Yeah. And okay. if you can just so, give a list of five or six things yeah. that you are using to make that decision uh, about that patient, now you're gonna call the intubation team, you're gonna call ICU, you're gonna intubate those patients. Okay, so I think firstly, let's get the conventional ones out the way. So patients that are becoming acidotic or having a rise in CO2, I mean, I think that's a very late sign. And, and, and we certainly haven't been routinely doing blood gases on patients to look for that. Um, if I'm struck by one thing in managing these patients, it's how the measure of oxygenation, like actually what the SATs is and the amount of support that the patient's on, how that doesn't really correlate that well with either the, the outcome in terms of needing intubation and also their clinical state. And everybody's got a story of seeing, you know, a very hypoxic patient playing on their phone, chatting, eating, etc. So um, for me, the key thing is respiratory effort, which involves um, both looking at their chest rise and also obviously the respiratory rate. Um, I think that um, uh, any alteration in sensorium um, is, very, is very important. Um, we've looked at the ability to, I mean, we've, we've recorded this data in our study, you know, the ability to, to complete commands, uh, finish full sentences, or whether they're only speaking in words or phrases. Um, and then also there's something about the patient themselves. So, so patients that are morbidly obese and often don't benefit that much from proning, I think are also patients that I, that I think about intubating early. Um, it's very difficult to be dogmatic uh, and set some like very clear lines in the sand and say, you know, beyond this we should intubate. And I sometimes worry that, um, you know, there's an element of, object, uh, of subjectivity in this which um, clouds our decision making. But as I say, I mean, we've all seen patients looking very comfortable on a lot of support, um, and despite sets in the mid 80s who, who then turn the corner and don't require ventilation. So um, there is a, a considerable gray area, which I think. Um, and the worsening, the worsening tachycardia? Do you think that yeah, that's. So, sorry, I left that out. So, yeah, tachycardia, 
I mean, I think tachycardia is an ominous sign. I mean, it, it, I mean, basically what you're looking for is a surrogate for oxygen delivery. I mean, we know that oxygen um, saturation doesn't really determine tissue oxygenation because we know that these patients are awake and they're passing urine. And, and so, you know, their lactates are low. Um, so they don't have evidence of tissue hypoxia. But when patients start becoming tachycardic, I think it is also a marker of, of worsening you know, oxygen delivery. I mean, it also becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because patients get anxious, their basal metabolic oxygen consumption goes up, they become tachycardic, their oxygen demand is increased and therefore they, you know, kind of in a, in a spiral for, um, um, you know, a, a spiral that eventually ends up in intubation. Yeah. Okay. Have, uh, have we managed to get Usha online? Uh, Graham, unfortunately, not at this point. We are still battling. Uh, for some reason, the unmuting function on her side is not working. Uh, okay. Graham, there are a number of questions that I've posted into the general chat, which I'm sure you can read. Yeah. Um, Linda, was, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Just before we... Um, just finally, yeah. I want to know in Greg's uh, series of cohort, has he found any complications related to high flow itself rather than disease process such as what has been reported in, pedi in the pediatric population, pneumothoraces and uh, related uh, complications? Um, we've, had no, it's, we've had no cases of barotrauma. I mean, I, I, so we've looked at reasons for discontinuing high flow and we've had two or three patients who've developed uh, epistaxis and, and have required uh, you know, kind of tamponade hemostasis with, uh, with, with, with balloons in the nose. And, and that's obviously meant that high flow uh, wasn't able to be continued. I mean, I must say it's quite difficult to know whether that's just because of high flow. I mean, I think we're all aware of the phenomenon of so-called double oxygen where patients get transported on a reservoir bag and, and 15 liters of nasal cannula oxygen, and that's not humidified and that causes a lot of dryness in the upper airway. So, you know, it's difficult to be sure whether that's just because of high flow. But um, uh, I mean, I think that the big concern in terms of uh, complications is um, are we potentially proceeding with patients on high flow for longer than we should? Okay, and should we be like incubating those patients for The host would like you to unmute it, you see. Uh, Graham, I suspect we found Usha. I think it may work now because yeah. I see agenda blah, blah, blah. I just sure. see something that says the host would like you to unmute and unmute it. So it may work. Yeah, and now I see a green thing. I think you've done whatever you've done. I think you've actually. Osha, can you hear us? We can hear you. <laughs> okay. And now. Uh... Usha, we can hear you loudly and clearly, and we can see you. And we can see you. Graham, I think we should proceed with some questions. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's have some questions from the uh, from from the uh, chat function, Mark. Uh, so Graham, we've had quite a few here, which I've posted into the general chat. Um, which uh, I'm going to just try and uh, uh, zip through. It's very helpful having Greg right here because he can read them at the same time. Uh, Greg, we can see that there's been awesome. one really good question about uh, the, uh, the PF ratio from the top, uh, the role of high, um, HFNO post when the dust settles. I think the Oscar meant to say when the virus settles. Uh, and how would uh, we okay. supply oxygen? Okay, so the first question is about uh, infection control and asks whether you need a negative pressure room. I mean, I, I have to say that um, provision of high flow outside of an ICU setting really is a compromise based on, um, you know, the, the caseload and, and the resources. So um, it would be great if high flow could be offered in a setting where you have single rooms, negative pressure and a nurse for every patient. But I mean, clearly that's not what we're able to offer. So we're doing it in... Um, the normal ward, we don't have extraction. Um, we have obviously said that anybody being nursed, or any, any doctor or nurse working in that area must wear an N95. Um, so we, we're trying to adhere to, we, you know, we accept that high flow is considered still to be an aerosolizing uh, procedure, but no, we're not using negative pressure rooms. 
Um, the next question is about clinical criteria for high flow versus intubation. I mean, hopefully I've covered that. I mean, what I am going to say is that I think that patients that are still on high flow after day two, uh, based on that data showing you that the median, um, you know, the median time to intubation was about two days, I think should be carefully reviewed. And if they're not improving, should be considered for mechanical ventilation. But I mean, I, I can't, you know, that's just an observation. It's not really a, a, a firm recommendation. So um, has the mean PF ratio been determined for those that were um, intubated versus those that weren't? That weren't. So I, I can't give you a p-value on that, but I can tell you that the PF ratio in survivors was 77. So it's certainly not that the survivors represented a, a much better group ab initio. Um, uh, how can we use high flow when the dust is settled on COVID? Well, I mean, I think um, there's already, I mean, the pediatricians have been using it for years and um, it, it's been studied, you know, post-extubation um, as a bridge to intubation for oxygenation. It's been used uh, in other forms of um, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. But I think the big difference is that in the studies that have looked at it um, for the treatment of bacterial pneumonia, for example, there's always been an acceptance that that uh, ICU is available, and that the more you know that that, that survival when intubated um, is 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 pretty good, and therefore there's a quite a low threshold for transitioning from high flow to to intubation. And I think what what makes COVID unique is that we've pushed that boundary out a lot further than we would otherwise have been comfortable with. Okay, uh, Rob Fricks from PE is asking about uh, patient self-induced lung injury. Um, I mean, I think that's a very real um, concern. I mean, I think patients often do. So Rob's referring to the fact that uh, spontaneously breathing patients um, are the ones that generate very negative intracural pressures, and that also puts a lot of mechanical work across the lung, um, and that can cause lung injury in the same way that positive pressure does. I mean, I think that's a real concern, but I, I do, however, think that positive pressure ventilation must be more injurious. So. Um, you know, we, we may be going on too long in patients with high flow. Um, I, you know, I don't think our observational data is going to answer this question, and uh, you know, we're not going to be able to randomise patients. Okay, so patients who remain dependent on high flow beyond day ten, do you continue the use of prednisone in, uh, of steroids in these patients? Um, the answer is, um, if I've gone through the the checklist of making sure it's not cardiogenic, um, uh, pulmonary vascular. I mean, bearing in mind that there are major um, obstacles to being definitive about any of those things, or, or you knows a kind of infection, then yes, I, I would consider steroids and I will take it off over a longer period. Again, that's not based on any data. Um, any specific challenges in patients with COPD using high flow? No, I mean, as I said, it's not really associated with barotrauma in adults. Um, uh, you know, this, I, I guess the reason why you're asking is a concern about the theoretical risk that patients with COPD um, might have um, reduced respiratory drive if you give them high uh, concentrations of oxygen. Um, I mean, I think that that's largely been debunked um, just in general, but also specifically on high flow. And in fact, patients with hypercapnia, um, although that generally would be an indication for intubation, actually have accelerated clearance of CO2 because remember you're flushing out the dead space all the way down to the conducting airways. So in fact, sometimes CO2 removal is actually enhanced. If I can just add one extra thing into my answer to Rob Frex about patient self-induced lung injury, my other concern um, in pursuing high flow for very long periods is that we all know that um, high FIO2s can cause fibrosis in the lung. I and mean, we know that from, from pediatric literature as well. So, I mean, that's the other potential harm that high flow can do is that you, you know, because you're not offering the same amount of PEEP as someone on the mechanical ventilator, you compensate by offering a high FIO2. And, and high FIO2s for a long time are potentially also injurious. Sorry, Greg, there was one question offline by email uh, wondering about if you don't have high flow CPAP. So, um, I mean, this is a personal uh, opinion. Um, I mean, I know that some of the guidelines recommend high flow over non-invasive ventilation. I mean, I think the ability to provide PEEP above five centimeters of water is very advantageous to the uh, pathophysiology of COVID-19 pneumonia. So I think it will reduce patients off induced lung injury. It's going to recruit atelectatic lung units. And it's certainly, a, 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 I mean, I, in my opinion, I think it's a, it's a very attractive form of non-invasive support. 
The problem in our setting is that it's not scalable. Um, it requires a lot more in terms of nursing resource. I mean, patients on, on CPAP, um, you know, they, their masks don't fit, the masks become disconnected, there's more aerosolization. So, uh, you know, I think that if you are able to offer CPAP, I think that's, that, that's, that's very good enough. In fact, the, the Society for Critical Care Guidelines say that, you know, if you're failing halfway, you can consider a non-invasive ventilation for a short period. But as I say, I mean, practically in our setting, that just really hasn't been something that we've been able to offer on a, on a, on a big scale, and certainly not to the numbers that we have with high flow. Graham, I know we passed the, we passed the hour, but uh, we found Usha and Ventilate <laughs> so she's online. Usha, I have, I have Hi. Thanks for joining us. Sorry for the technical... So, topic. no, so sorry. That was a bit of a general rush there to get on. <laughs> Always so good. If, if there's any experiences from uh, from Tigerberg that you want to bring in and any sort of questions or issues you want to pose to Greg, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. No, I literally just came um, on with the, the question of non-invasive and CPAP. Um, and, you know, and it was it's quite convenient because we had a, quite a massive discussion about this over the last couple of days. Um, you know, there's, there's good enough evidence in, in from the UK and the US and you know that there have been good results using it um, from a practical point of view in the ICU especially with our um, nursing ratio and doctors ratio I be tending not to kind of um, lean towards that area that um, using non-invasive purely be because if they're failing and you don't have that one to one or one to two, it can be quite hazardous. And um, quite a few patients you know, to put on PPE and to get there is is quite um, quite a, um, a, a risk for the patient um, because they don't have much time before they start desaturating. Um, it's obviously less tolerated than than the high flow, um, and you know, especially when they're starting to deteriorate, which can happen quite. Um, significantly and rapidly, um, you know, it, you could end up with quite a few um, un, unexpected or preventable deaths. So we're kind of leaning towards or leaning away from using CPAP and that if they fly, uh, fail high flow, um, purely to intubate them uh, if necessary rather than go that way. Mm. Because they certainly need the pressures that CPAP um, gives that um, high flow, as Greg says, doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I've listened. Yeah, sorry. And any other problems that you, uh, any problems that you've specifically had at Tigerberg with um, high flow nasal oxygen that you kind of want to bring people's attention to? That, that yeah, I think Greg um, covered quite a few of them, with just in terms of you know the cannula, the correct size, the need um, to make sure that it doesn't block, um, you know, because the evos um, they do not warn. Um, you know, the, the nursing staff or the staff around him that they have blocked and these patients quite desaturate very quickly. So the, the proper size of the cannula is extremely important. Um, you know, from a practical point of view for patients or for hospitals that are considering it, um, you know, we, we cohort our setup in the ICU is such that we have cohorted rooms. It has become an issue um, in terms of the these patients are so awake, and I've mentioned it before, they're so awake and so communicate. They know they communicate very well. They know what's happening. They make friends with the people around them. They pray together, which is something I've noticed recently. Um, but they also watch people deteriorating very quickly and actually dying. So I think psychological um, support for them is extremely important. Um, also, you know, that was a massive challenge for us to try and kind of prepare protect their dignity and their pride during this whole ICU experience, obviously it's a very scary um, experience, um, you know, to, to kind of get screens between the two beds, um, to try and move them out so that they actually stay together, but that becomes logistically impossible. So that's one thing I think you need to consider when you're doing this high flow in cohorted rooms to get psychological support for the, for the patients as well. They're scared already coming in. Um, and it's and I can imagine the post-traumatic stress disorder they're going to have after ICU. Um, something quite close to my heart, yeah. No, no, thanks very much for bringing in that important aspect. I think that's that's a really important component, and and it clearly.
these this is this is not a usual uh, ICU situation where it's a situation where people are awake but critically exactly. ill and able to, to, to look at the at the uh, sort of fellows in in the in the beds and see what's happening alongside them. So I, I think that's a really important point to bring up. And yeah, we've I'll started antidepressants quite um, quite soon in many of our patients already, and it's something that you should be considering as well. And I don't yeah. know if Greg touched upon it about transferring the patients and the use of oxygen, and that's that's a big issue as well. Um, mm -hmm. To make sure that your oxygen tanks are full before you transfer. <laughs> something simple, but hey. <laughs> No, thanks very much, Usha, and, and it's great that you were able to join us and, and uh, add, add the uh, sort of perspective from Tigerberg. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Sorry for all the issues. No, thanks. Um, Mark, uh, I just wanted to uh, wrap up with two points quickly for, for Greg. Just uh, if you can just touch on the issue of the problems of the cannula and the frequency with which the nursing staff and medical staff need to monitor these patients. Uh, and what can go wrong in terms of blockage, in terms of the, the actual cannulas coming off, et cetera? Um, so, um, I mean, I think as we've alluded to, um, these patients are really on an eye edge of oxygenation. And um, if the cannula come out, patients can lose consciousness within minutes. Um, unfortunately, um, we try to select patients that are awake and able to manage the interface themselves, but sometimes it gets dislodged, especially when patients are being prone. Um, and, 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 and the two most common things are either that the, the nasal cannula itself gets blocked, but more commonly it's that it actually gets kinked. Um, and I'm, you know, the, the rep actually asked me to, Julia asked me to remind everyone that they don't have to be like rammed into the nose, but usually sit just on the top lip with about 50 to 70% of the cannula sitting inside the nose. If they kink, the machine automatically compensates by dropping the flow. Um, and so um, what we've instituted is almost like an hourly cannula round where we just walk through the ward and make sure that, that patients are aware and, uh, and are able to kind of adjust the interface themselves and that we can check the stats and, and correct the position of the cannula. I mean, that's obviously not ideal, but it's within the constraints of our, of our nursing resources. And I mean, our nurses are, are excellent at, at looking out for that as well, but uh, it just requires constant vigilance. And uh, as I say, I mean, you know, we, this is not a foolproof mechanism. Um, it's not a foolproof treatment, um, but it's a, 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 a it's, it's a treatment that comes with very low stress from the provider to, to assemble it and put it on. It's much less complex than non-invasive ventilation. It doesn't come with the risk and the personal exposure of intubation. Um, and it's got a reasonable success rate, and that's why we think it's, an, it's uh, something that can be scaled up in our setting. Yeah, and, and Greg, I mean, just to give the audience some perspective is that we've got up to 35 machines running across three wards uh, at when, when we're at maximum capacity. Is it, and and it's, it's checking in on it's all of those. Two machines, yeah. um, so, and finally, I just wanted to kind of, uh, kind of pick up on the one point that you mentioned about its use as a kind of temporizing measure for those patients who are very likely to require ventilation so soon after arrival at hospital. And I've, I've found that, you know, sometimes patients coming in with SATs of 50% you can get them onto high flow if you've got an efficient team within 10 to 15 minutes, and that gives you time to call in the intubation team to contact ICU. And I find that that's been a really important role, even if that patient is going to subsequently require ventilation. Yeah, I mean, as, I mean, as, as we've said, it's, it's something that's very easy to assemble in a very short space of time, and there's no anxiety as to you know whether you'll be able to intubate the patient or whether you'll be able to get the interface on in time. And uh, and in the same way, I've seen patients where I thought we must definitely call the intubation team, but let's temporize them with high flow. And then some of them have stabilized and not required intubation. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to know. I mean, although anecdotally, I will say those have been the, the younger patients. Um, I've just been asked to include a, a, a comment from someone at the CTICC where um, um, the, the, the question is, we have eight high flow machines there. Do you recommend we discuss patients we consider for high flow? Um, I guess I'm interpreting the question to be, um, should they discuss patients that they are considering for high flow there on their machines with us? And I mean, I, 
I'd be quite loath to be the custodian of a resource like Highflow. I mean, as, I, as I've said, you know, it gives people a lot of comfort that they can put on something quite quickly while a, while a decision is, is deferred or made. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think if, if you guys have got people that you think are suitable candidates, I mean, it really just is a resource problem. Um, you, you will have seen that most of our patients are young with, uh, with little in the way of, of serious comorbidities other than um, diabetes and hypertension. But certainly in Europe, patients were, who weren't ICU candidates were offered high flow, and some of those patients will survive. So, so rationalizing that use of high flow only for patients that are ICU candidates, I think we have to be clear, is purely a resource decision. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a utility uh, based decision. Okay, so so thanks very much, Greg. Uh, to, well, to Andrew, Greg, uh, the panel, uh, Usha, uh, Linda, and, and Lydia, a really excellent uh, webinar this afternoon, and, and I think very useful to clinicians across the country to hear about this this new, well, expanded strategy for man for dealing with COVID nineteen that has had, uh, you know, good outcomes for our patients uh, in in Cape Town. Um, so. That sort of concludes this week's uh, webinar. Just to say that we'll be uh, back again uh, next week. We're planning two short talks, one on uh, serological tests in, in COVID uh, and the other one uh, around the use of antibiotics in the context of, of uh, the COVID epidemic. Um, so we'll send out the advert uh, over the weekend or Monday uh, to, to give you more information about those talks. And thanks very much for attending uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat>